as soon as these models can take actions, there is someone that can make the model do the action, no matter if the action is intended or not and in whatever context. If you have enough context length, there exists this attack. And that's quite interesting from a security perspective that like, this always exists. I don't think we're there yet to deploy these models at a large scale. Hey, what's up, everyone? And welcome to another episode of the Twimmel AI podcast. I am your host, Sam Charrington. And today I'm joined by Jonas Skyping. Jonas is a research group leader at Ellis Institute and Max Planck Institute for Intelligent Systems, Tübingen. Jonas is lead author on a really interesting paper exploring the state of LLM security called Coercing LLMs to Do and Reveal Almost Anything. Before we dig in, if you're not already subscribed to the show, be sure to hit that subscribe button if you're watching us on YouTube or the follow button if you prefer listening in on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. Jonas, welcome to the podcast. Yeah, I'm glad to be here. Let's get into it. I'm looking forward to the conversation. I want to start out by saying that I really appreciate papers like this one that attempt to bring some structure to important and fast moving areas like LLM security in this case and adversarial attacks. How did you start working in this area? In the sort of like this research community, we have a longer history of doing episodial examples and doing episodial attacks in vision. And for the longest time, like this wasn't really feasible for large language models. Like we thought these existed, but we didn't really have a good way of doing these. For example, like if you scroll back to like papers we did a year ago, they were like, oh, here's some attack, but it doesn't really work for large language models. But it really seemed like a temporary roadblock. And then like over the summer, people actually came out, like it was a very good paper by Andy Zhou, came out with a attack that actually does work on language models. And it sort of opened the floodgate for all these attacks that came out, which really are like on the technical side, these are different optimization algorithms that optimize some output to a, to a language model. Maybe that was unintended. And so it's a really interesting space to be in right now because there's a lot of these optimization algorithms coming out and a lot of questions of like, how reliable are these techs? How quickly do they work? But so in this work, we really want to talk not so much about the technicality that you could, like how you would like make the optimization nicer in some way or another, but more about like what you could actually do with this. Like what, what, does, what does this mean? What do these attacks imply? One of the biggest takeaways for me was, you know, we we talk very aspirationally about uh, this near future in which LLMs are kind of the core of these agentic systems that are out doing things on our behalf and interacting with the physical world. And this paper very clearly says from a security perspective, we are not there. The last thing you want to have is an LLM based system, at least, you know, something based on our current technology interacting with the outside world. Yeah, exactly. Like we have all these aspirations right now that we want to like use them in agent systems, but we want to use them for coding, we want to use them as like as agents. If they are agents, it means that they can take actions. And but what this paper really also what we try to show you is that many multiple ways that like, like as soon as these models can take actions, there is someone that can make the model do the action. No matter if the action is intended or not, and in whatever context, someone will be able to make the model do the action, no matter whether it's good or bad. So that is really like right now, we, I, don't, I don't think we're there yet to deploy these models at a large scale. You reference a paper in the paper that uh, if I interpreted your um, your summary of it correctly, it essentially says that for any, um, almost like for any uh, negative action that you want an LLM to take, there's some, at least a theoretical result that seems to suggest that given a long enough context, you can make it happen. Yeah, yeah, this is paper from Wolf at all, where they basically show this existence. Of course, there's some assumptions, but I think the assumptions actually are quite reasonable. Right. But then they show, okay, if you have enough context length, which we generally assume that someone has, right, then there exists this attack. And that's quite interesting from a security perspective that like this always exists. And another point that comes out of the paper, um, that connects to a topic that we've discussed recently on the podcast is around the the role that open open weight models play in this ecosystem. And you've laid out this scenario where many of the, the attacks that are known and prevalent are only known and prevalent because uh, we've got these open weight models to, to optimize against, to, to create these attacks against. What's your take on the the role of open models in the context of security? I think the biggest really role that these open models have is that they give us a, a framing where we can actually evaluate these attacks and makes uh, do research about these and figure out how reliable how they like 
how likely they are to exist. Like uh, basically, if, if you look at all these like research papers, they are all based on basically on llama derivatives, because um, there's a big difference in security research between like you can do hacking, <laughs> really, like you can like try to hack OpenAI system, which is a black box and you don't really understand it, and you can maybe, I mean, maybe many people have done very great, really in some sense hacks over this over the last half year or last year, where they get OpenAI's model to do something it wasn't supposed to. But it's not really security research. You don't really understand why the attack works or why it didn't work. And so for research, for security research to really understand the system, it needs to have some well-defined perimeter. And right, it could be like, okay, here's this open source model. It works exactly like this. And you can replicate the setup. You can run it on your own. So like, I think it really was a big, like having these open source models was a big enabler to do this to do this research and really understand how this works. There is of course this thing that, like we've seen good attacks that work as transfer from public models, but I think there is important to see that these aren't the only class of attacks. It's just one popular class. There also are attacks based on on genetic algorithms that are entirely query based. So like basically like from the security side, I think ch things wouldn't change so much if there were no open source models. We would just run different attack algorithms. But having these open source models makes it much easier to actually compare algorithms and to compare, like even also to compare defenses and to do research in defenses. It's not really research to like, just break OpenAI's API, although it is fun. Many of the attacks that are developed on these open models transfer over to the black box models. Can you talk a little bit about uh, that, how it works, and are there particular conditions uh, that enable that, or is it a, a general observation? To be honest, I think it's just something that we've that people have observed that we just don't understand very well right now. Um, it can definitely be improved. For example, you can make, if you make an attack that breaks multiple open source models, it's more likely to transfer. So these are findings that we do see. Because, and from that perspective, I think we have some intuition that there might be some mechanisms in the attack that are model specific and some that aren't. But really, I think the interesting observation is that there are model, almost model invariant mechanisms in these attacks that just work across models. It's interesting that the models really aren't so different. They're all based on the Zoma architectures, right? There's actually, they all actually are very similar architecturally. And they're also trained on very similar data because ultimately they're all scraped, trained on a very similar scrape on the internet. They're probably all tr trained mostly on common crawl scrapes. So with these two pieces together, of course, there's from a theoretical side, there's no clear understanding of why these attacks would work similarly. But at least some of the pieces are not so different between these, even these different companies. So we've got a generative AI community that um, we host in and around the podcast and, and kind of among our audience members. And one of the things that came up in uh, our last meetup was a game where the goal is to try to exfiltrate data from a LLM. One of the folks in our meetup kind of walked us through getting to level eight in this game and the various tricks that you have to um, bring the bear to try to get the LLM to give up essentially the secret code that it was told not to give up. And I think uh, one of the uh, the other really interesting uh, things that I took out of this paper is that we've spent a lot of time um, kind of thinking and talking about kind of securing system prompts and and uh, securing against extraction, but that's only one of the several classes of attacks against LLMs. Can you kind of talk us through the the broad landscape that you see? So, like the the thing that really like started out where we started out was soft jailbreak attacks. Really, the idea that the model is not supposed to have this or that behavior, right? It's not supposed to tell you how to build a bomb, and so you of course try to make it build a bomb. But like from a research security perspective, this was always more about the model is explicitly trained not to do this. And now we show that the model really still does it. So it's like right in like in this in this conversation that we're having, like if the if the defense is some reinforcement learning from human preferences that we do to make the model, let's say like be harmless and helpful, maybe in topic terms, then really this doesn't seem to work fully. And there really seem to be episode attacks that do happen and that make the model jailbreak. But of course, because the model only simulates text and because the model also is just not very good at building a bomb, these just aren't, like in the near term, these really aren't harms. It's not really harmful if the model right now tells me how to build a bomb. I could have Googled that. 
And even in, like in the near term, we don't think this will be very harmful. But there are many other things that these attacks, like on the technical side, the attack is exactly the same, but it can do all kinds of things. But it's almost like we, if we want the model to do something, then we build an attack just to make that happen. By exactly the same way as we can jailbreak it, we can also do it, for example, we can do some, some things I found interesting were these misdirection attacks, where we we try to build something like, for example, like the example we give in the paper is we just optimize over Chinese characters. So it's an, a string that's entirely Chinese. And if you understand Chinese, it really looks like gibberish. But if you're, as many of us, we don't understand Chinese very well, it sounds very reasonable to say, okay, hey, ChatGPT, can you translate this? And you paste in the string. But what comes afterwards is basically entirely under my control as the attacker. And then in the in the paper, we put in a Rickwell URL, but really you could, you, could, you could have put in any URL there and we could have made the model return any URL. Is that kind of an extractive attack in the sense of you have gotten the LLM to, you know, reveal or regurgitate some URL that's maybe somewhere in the training data. And so you would have to couple that with like some seeding kind of thing and try to inject things into the training data? Or was that a totally arbitrary URL and the the attack essentially generated it from scratch via the uh, the LLM? Basically, this, this one is a bit of both um, because we do believe that this URL exists in training data. But we actually have the same example in the appendix where we just optimized for, I think, the Dune trailer for Dune 2, which was after the model cutoff. It was just a random YouTube video after the random cutoff, which we can also make happen. Even YouTube, if you were talking about YouTube URLs, the model knows YouTube URLs very well, the structure of those, et, et cetera. Um, it's a, a little different perhaps than um, pointing to an arbitrary URL or kind of you know a data URL that's arbitrary bytes. Yes or no? Maybe it might be slightly harder in the sense it might require just, more tokens to point it to something else. <laughs> just slightly. Right. We, we also do this very academic example, which I think is not so fun, but like brings this point across. It's like we optimize for a random number sequence. I think this is one of the early examples in the paper where it's just it really, but really, it really is a sample of a random number sequence. This was not in the training data and it's really entirely random. And now we opt just optimize for inputs. So really that the model collapses onto the random number sequence. And this is interesting for two reasons. Like for one reason is because the input actually is to us entirely inscrutable. It's just, I think if you scroll to that part of the paper, it's just entirely random tokens to us. But to the model, this token sequence will always produce this number sequence. Like the model is actually 100% confident that these numbers should come after this gibberish text beforehand. And in the same way, we could optimize for any completion here. Like we, like we, like we also optimize for, I think that's, if that was confusing, like we also up, have had our abstract of the paper. So we wrote the abstract and then we optimized for, is, for a sequence of tokens that generates this abstract word by word exactly. <laughs> which of course the model hadn't seen before, right? The, we just wrote the abstract, <laughs> which is more like we just try to illustrate the point that this is possible, really for like in the sense of the theoretical work from Wolf at all. That really, for anything we want, there exists a string that really makes the model output it. And yeah, these are just yeah the numbers are more more, more academic example of but of, of this exact same thing that it could really could be anything. In the the title of the paper, you um, and I mentioned this earlier, you note parenthetically almost anything. Is that uh, is that humility, or have you identified specific classes of uh, uh, things that you can't get a model to regurgitate, or or uh, ways to attack a model? So that there are a bunch of things that we we note on in like the in the last section, which weren't so easy yet. But I think the important here is, thing here is always that these things were not possible yet. And we really make no claim that these could more, might be possible in the future. So for example, like one thing that I really want to do is that um, basically you can make this attack that uh, I think like Ryan Good said posted about a few months ago. You can optimize for an invisible string. And so you can optimize an attack that's really invisible to all observers because it operates only in Unicode bytes. Meaning non-printable Unicode bytes that you know could be there in the middle of a paragraph and just blow up the LLM or make it do something un unexpected. Yes, exactly. If you copy paste it, it just looks like nothing. But if you insert it, then it could be arbitrarily long in terms of tokens. Yeah, so those were just hard to optimize. Like it's a very hard constraint space technically. But on the other, like we do know that attacks exist that work in this constraint space. It was just hard to find them automatically. 
the examples like this. Or there's also the example that we wanted. To, I wanted to make the model uh, produce NAN outputs in the sense that like uh, a NAN is not a number, right? And this is this is interesting if you're doing batched inference and you're producing not a number in your batch, then this could really screw up your production system really. If you produce logits that are out of bounds of, let's say, a float 16 or float 32. In practice, this was very hard because ultimately, like the, a model has lots of layer norms, it's very hard to produce logits that are out of bounds. But I think it's interesting that the, to think about these attacks. That like, what could we, like, what, like the NAN example is a bit of an abstract attack, right? It's not really like, it really targets the internal workings of this model. And I think it was interesting for us to think about, like, is this possible? Like, how easy is this to optimize over that? And even like why the nanotech didn't quite succeed, I think like I'm not certain that it could never succeed. And right then, then you have to then you have to have a system where, yeah, depending on how the inference server is set up, this could blow it up in a practical sense. Like, and really be a denial of service attack. The paper seems to suggest that uh, a possible source for a lot of the vulnerabilities is. Uh, all of the work that's been done to ensure that these models perform well on coding types of tasks. Did I interpret that correctly? Yeah. One thing we really want to do with this paper is just show a lot of these attacks. And so in the paper, we have all these tables that show these attacks. And I think just like scrolling through these and looking at them, it's really quite clear that a lot of them just work because they sort of like simulate code in a way, right? Like the model really is a simulator and normally it simulates a chat conversation. But it seems to very easily flip into a behavior where it simulates code execution. And this is, of course, sort of like a role play. Like the model is not actually running code. But to the model, it seems a bit similar. Right? This is why, like, you can't, we can't really get the model to swear. But we can optimize for it. And then we see, okay, the model says, oh, slash new command, swear word. And then it can swear suddenly. Like, um, but right? it's using really, it's like really like the attack that we optimize for entirely automatically discovers the word new command to make some of these attacks happen. Or it or discovers like rewrite rule or something like these, these are keywords. But to us, they sound like keywords. And that's quite interesting. Or also something that's very related to this is that we actually just often see that the model is uh, separate from, from code. The model is like, if we just optimize these attacks, the model also exploits the text that really um, exploit the chat interface, which, we, which we've called role hacking, which is related to code. But now here, the model doesn't simulate um, some code example, but the model actually simulates the chat interaction going differently. Meaning, for example, the attack might have multiple turns within it that seem to have, yeah, seem to have uh, come to be through uh, the chat interaction. Yeah, yeah. Right, or, or sometimes we see that the model has like, the attack is optimized for something that looks like a fake system token. Right, like in Llama, the system message is delineated by two system tokens. They're called like sys and end of sys. And sometimes the attacks optimize something that looks close to a system token to the model, where I guess the model tricks is, is now tricked into thinking, okay, then it's another, another system message coming. Or it's tricked into saying like, okay, the user's message has ended here especially to the use of brackets and, and uh, parentheses, where sometimes the model might actually open up, like the attack might open up several parentheses. And then maybe you have some, we have some collision that we want. Maybe we want the model to say, oh, can you give me a refund? So the model basically says, okay, I can give you a refund. And then it ends the brackets and the, the parentheses as if these were like one entity, right? In this way, there's like, so like the roles are being hacked. The model thinks like this part is, this is part of the user message, but really this was its response to say like, oh yeah, sure, I can give you these details. Yeah, sure, I can execute this function. That's part of it, it's response. But the model is sort of tricked into thinking this was a user user question. And afterwards it says, oh, that's a funny question, I can't do that. But it has done it already, it just hasn't realized. Of course, of course, realize is a bit of like, like a, right, um, there's a figure of speech here. It is a still a large language model. And there's also a point here that really it's a machine and it's a, like, um. Really, the point that we want to make here is also like still this is uh, it's just a very large adversarial net, a very large neural network, and these adversarial attacks exist for all neural networks. 
And even though we use it as a chatbot, we think it's very useful. It's still like a very, it's very, a very convincing system to us. Under the hood, it's still a neural network and it has these adversarial attacks. And why is that observation particularly important for you? What do you want folks to take away from that connection? We, of course, improved adversarial robustness under some threat models in vision. But the problem never really went away. We didn't really solve this question in vision. It just ended up being that ultimately users rarely had direct ex direct inputs to a vision neural network. Like it's just, it just wasn't such a big problem in practice. Like the, like, so like, like the biggest thing that we deployed to users was something like maybe like a, everyone now has, has a, let's say a Google lens on their phone and they can point at the pictures and it like tells them what it is, what kind of butterfly it is. And you can, of course, adversarially attack that, but there's not really a big harm in it. And you can, of course, like put some, yeah. But now we deploy these chat models and people are using, like, this is probably like the biggest application that we've ever seen of neural networks. Suddenly, suddenly there are millions of people actually they're using these chat models. And, but like on the security side, we're still on the same part. We're still thinking, okay, if our examples exist, we haven't really solved these. Here are language models now. Suddenly lots of people are interfacing with these systems and they're inter interfacing with them in a way where they can actually have free text input to the system. Right, and Envision actually was often very, the path was very tricky to actually get an attack in because if you print something out, you have to make an attack that works if you print it out and then actually feed it into the model because the model is digital and the attacks are often physical. But here, now the user has, has a very direct input, right? They put in some text and the text directly goes into the language model. So it's a much more immediate access to the model and much more immediate feedback for the user. Thinking about the context, you know, so much of the past 20, 30 years of, you know, just general security, nothing to do with machine learning is, you know, has essentially been to get developers to stop trusting text that people put into a box, right? Or pass in through a URL or something else. And here, you know, the systems by design are taking uh, free, free text. Right. And this is, of course, like, this is the better, biggest strength, of course, right? Like these segments are so useful because they they can take in freeform inputs and then produce freeform outputs. This is why they're so great to us, right? They're, why they're so useful, so versatile. At the same time, it really is like to us, it feels a bit like SQL injection, where you can really put in anything and you and you can do almost anything with the output. It really feels a bit similar. You referenced the tables in the paper, and we'll refer folks to those and how a lot of the examples there look like you know code. I'm I'm curious how stable are those optima those sequences in the sense that you know if you generate one of those which is you know done through some optimization process you know have you explored or have others explored you know then starting to tweak you know change a parentheses to a bracket or just starting to manually uh, manipulate them to see where that gets you do you quickly kind of fall off of the optima or does it uh also do bad things uh but just slightly different it's a good question. Um, we haven't done as much research on this question, but but it's a good one. Um, basically, like on the just on the existence of these optima, basically, if you just rerun our code, you'll probably never find these exact strings again. Maybe that's a very interesting statement. That basically, um, we think the space of these possible strings is very large, and there are many of these optima that have similar function. On the other hand, though. Um, if you look at these string, if you stare at these for too long, you definitely observe that um, there are some tokens that just do nothing, in the sense that they just they just don't hurt the optimization process because the optimization process is largely based on a random search, and just maybe some tokens were randomly chosen and just didn't do a lot, and you probably could excise those later without the attack working any differently. But this is certainly not true for all of them. It's just not something that like I think like technically we could sort of like maybe compress the attack later. Or figure out only which tokens really mattered and which tokens really have, like carry function. But on the practical side, like why would you? You're like we're rarely constrained by number of tokens in the input, so that not all of them are functional is maybe not so important to us. But though, we'll be good to understand actually which ones are the functional ones. Do you think that they're, you know, we just kind of scratching at? The, the problem here, and there's a lot of latitude to apply even more sophisticated uh, attack vectors if uh, an attacker so needed. 
Yeah, two things. Um, so the first thing, um, I should be more careful here. Like this is it, the work that works well is this attack by Zuadal, and that's not quite random search in a very important distinction. Basically, the distinction is that the attack uses the gradient of the model to basically prune the search tree. Because normally, for every position, you have, let's say, like 32,000 tokens in your vocabulary. So you have to random search over all 32,000. But the, this algorithm actually uses the gradient of the model to figure out which 256 tokens have the largest influence and then does a random search only over those. And these are then resampled every time the random search is done. So this is like a, this is a pruning before the search is being done. This is GCG optimization? Exactly. And it's actually interesting in two ways. Um, this is interesting because if you just, you could also have done a straight gradient search. You can, um, the problem is an integer, like a nonlinear integer problem, but you can relax it into a continuous space and do gradient search. But for stronger models, like for example, for, especially for the Lama 2 models, a straightforward gradient search doesn't actually work well. Like we did this in previous space, we have a paper called PEZ. But it like the attack of PEZ doesn't really work well for for these large scale safety tune models. Like the GCPD paper was so big for us because it showed that it's not that no gradient based optimizer can work. It's just that the way we've been doing gradient based optimization has been not optimal and it needed this, this bigger random component. So previously, we thought that gradient based optimizers were not going to work for this problem. And this introduced some more structured randomness. Basically, you get this gradient per token of how you should change, like to what token you should change to. And in the gradient based approach, maybe you would, um, maybe you pick the largest, the token with the largest gradient magnitude. But, but what the GCG algorithm basically is, is you actually collect this list of 256 largest magnitude candidates, and then you select randomly from these. So really, it's sort of like, it's a bit of a hybrid between a full random search and a gradient-based optimization. And this seems to overcome some barriers in the optimization landscape that we're like, just taking the, the most, like the largest magnitude gradient doesn't seem to work. It's really something that we just don't understand well, like why this, why this particular optimization algorithm works. Ultimately, these are all heuristics for this nonlinear integer program. Does GCG work particularly well specifically in the context of LLMs? And the reason why I ask that is because I thought that gradient-based optimization was the general approach that was taken for on the vision side for like, we're going to find some noise that we can inject that doesn't change an image much and, you know, produces weird results. So, and it's, so it's a little, um, uh, it's interesting for me to hear that you say that, you know, we thought that that didn't work. Is it, is it a very domain specific? Uh, I think it's very domain specific in the sense that we're optimizing over something discrete here. For images, of course, images really are also discrete on some level, in the sense that like pixels are discrete values. When we optimize for attacks, we assume it's a floating point value, and we optimize the attack in floating points where the inputs are continuous. And there, we don't have this problem, really. There's been a flurry of work over the last two months on different optimization attack um, approaches. This is also some paper that I haven't really understood well enough yet to really claim on how well this attack works. We're really going back to gradient based optimizers, but with a different twist on how to handle the discreteness of the space better. Like this, this really is a space that's evolving very rapidly right now. And to be honest, I think in a year, we will know much more like which tech works and we'll probably will have one that's much better than the one we have right now. Like right now, TCG really is a hammer that at least works reliably and that was a big thing for us because it was the first one that did work reliably. But it really opened up the playing field for some people to work in this field and say, okay, we can do better. Here are our optimizers that work better. And there's been a lot of research in those over the last months that we're now beginning to to unravel and read each of the papers and figure out, okay, this works, this really works, or this really maybe doesn't work in the same generality. And at least the space that's evolving a lot right now. I'm wondering if there's any work that looks at the role that uh, RLHF 
plays in making models more or less susceptible to these attacks? Or does it not matter because you still have a neural network and it's the fundamental neural networkness that gives way to these attacks? So we definitely don't have a good really like principled reference I could point you to. But we've, we've, we've definitely observed that these attacks are easier if the all is not done. Like it really seems to do something in the sense that this way, like, like especially like, uh, I think there's a sentiment in the, that's evolving in the community right now that it's not really worth running these optimizers against a model that's not Llama 2 chat. Or because, because more, like if you run it against, let's say, um, it's a bit in the sense that like if you run it against something that's maybe like Vicuña or it's like, uh, or maybe one of the Falcon models, if you run it against these systems that are not trained using reinforcement learning from human feedback, these systems are even, let's say, like even more persuadable. It's too easy and not fun. And it detects that <laughs> it detects that too easy. Yeah, yeah. But even like, but also too easy in the sense that we think that these models, if they just if it is trained by simple fine tuning, they aren't good models. So like models now in the sense of like a scientific model, they don't they aren't good models where we can um, evaluate attacks and defenses that will. Say, tell something meaningful about systems like ChatGPT or systems like Entropic's cloud models, which are extensively safety tuned. Like we actually think that like these safety tuned models like Llama are a more meaningful benchmark because they are closer to reality and how these models are being used. And really, they are hard. They are hard to optimize in the sense that it takes fewer steps to find a, a successful attack, for example, for Pythia. Or maybe what's interesting is that if you like Pathia, these open source models are not at all um, fine tuned. Interestingly, for Pathia, also gradient based approaches work. They just don't work for these safety tuned models. So the, the reinforcement learning does seem to do something. It's, but on the, on the other hand, it's also it's not sufficient to prevent these attacks. Have you gained an intuition as to? what, if anything, is going to work and make the models more safe? You know, is it scaling the number? Well, we haven't even talked about the um, relationship between scale in terms of number of parameters and ease of uh, manipulating the models. But, you know, is it scaling? Is it, you know, more uh, RLHF, you know, maybe more examples? In terms of scaling, I think that's a very interesting question. And to be honest, I think the answer is we just don't know yet. Right now, it seems almost like uh, almost similar. Like the attack, we can make an attack against Llama 7b, and then to a similar extent against Llama 70b, 10 times larger. Where I think intuitively this looks a bit like uh, we think the 70b model is, has more capabilities of, to also to withstand attacks. But on the other hand, the 70b model has a larger internal representation space that can be attacked. And can be um, can be, there's, sort of like, there's sort of like more room for something to work, so kind of greater surface area. It almost feels a bit like that. Although this is why this is very intuitive, this is very speculative, right? We don't really have concrete studies on that. But really, it really feels like there's more surface area, but the model is also more capable. And this maybe this is how it works out. Then sensible defenses. There's there's been a flurry of work also on the defense side right now and where we just really haven't put them all into the same basket and really haven't gotten through of this. There are interesting, there are interesting simple things that make the attack harder. For example, the very simplest defense you can do is actually you can just filter for perplexity. Basically, the, you run the model over the text anyway. And if the input text has a very high perplexity, which is so like the tech, like the model, right, the model itself is a very strong model of language, like, so like by its design, and if the model is, thinks that uh, an input sequence is exceedingly unlikely, it might be an attack. This, of course, is only again is only another roadblock. You then you would optimize for attacks that have low perplexity. This is right, and it, well, it, the game often plays out like this. Um, but um, it's something that, like, maybe uh, maybe there's a future where we just pile on more and more of these roadblocks. Until it becomes computationally infeasible for most actors to make these attacks, I think that's currently the most positive scenario I could see. Right, there are also other roadblocks. There's like uh, this guard model. So, for example, there's like Llama Guard, 
vom Facebook, vom Meta, which is a model that's designed to detect if an output is adversarial or malicious or if an input is malicious. But of course, once you know this is happening, you make an attack that fools both the original model and the guard model. And security is always a bit like this. It's always like, if you know what's happening, then there probably is an attack that fools both the defense and the original model. The idea that, you know, ultimately, you know, the best we're going to do is, and you're not saying that, you're not saying that definitively that the best we're going to do, but, you know, we may end up in a future where the best we can do is make the cost of attack so high that uh, only the most committed can uh, implement the attack sounds, um, you know, pessimistic, unsatisfying, uh, you know, like not a great state to be in. But on the other hand, you know, that's kind of a lot of what security is like encryption. Like, you know, we, you know, make the, the keys so long that, you know, we can still use them on our computers, but it needs to be a nation state if they're going to crack it or, you know, that kind of thing, or it'll take a really long time. Like it's in some ways it's a, it's a reasonable result, even though it sounds kind of unsatisfactory. Yeah, I think that's very accurate, right? So, of course, we want systems for, like, for example, like this. There's some work on on certifying robustness, right? Which is a whole branch of research where we really want to be certain. We want to certify this that this cannot be, there can be no attack like this. And, like, from a research perspective, that's very motivating to work on this, this, this direction. But on the practical side, it might fall much closer to, like, all reasonably complicated systems, right? And maybe the analogy here is... No, it's a bit worth like a very, that the LLM itself is a bit like, uh, I don't know, like say like US, US, US government as a whole. And so like, of course, it has lots of security vulnerabilities if you spend enough time to find these because it's such a large and complicated system. And maybe these are inevitable. But it doesn't mean that like the US is like, government is like broken on the daily basis, right? Like it can be both true that these attacks exist, but that most people don't really use them even that most attacks don't really fit, succeed. But this will like play, like how this plays out in practice will depend a lot on, uh, so like how strong these roadblocks are that we, that we put up. And this is something we don't know yet. What's interesting is that um, you also mentioned guardrails and there are much more positive about, let's say like strong guardrails but just in the way that like if the model can only respond in a few ways and maybe it can only respond in a JSON format where you know exactly like where it's supposed to put something, then at least your attack surface again is reduced, right? The model can still like maybe detect and still put whatever it wants inside the guardrail, but not everywhere anymore. So the guardrails really are like fundamentally there's like nothing you can do. If, if it's supposed to be a JSON string, then under like maybe like Nemo or something, then it's going to be a JSON string. But guardrails are also a bit unsatisfying to us, I think, because they really restrict the model's output into a very tight box, right? And then on the very extreme side, I think there was this paper at some point where people said, okay, yeah, we solved this problem by, um, by just collecting a large database of likely user outputs. So we just collected, let's say, like 1 million user questions. We used our LLM to generate answers to all these. And if you query our system, we'll just give you the closest answer in, that we have in our tool, in our database. And that's, of course, safe, right? You have, like, all the 1 million answers. You can go through them and see that they're safe. But it's really, like, it's defeating the strength of the LLM if you use it in this way. As we try to get more out of LLMs, it becomes less about kind of this one model and more about, like, this complex interaction of multiple models um, that helps achieve... Uh, you know, whatever sets of goals. Uh, and I'm wondering if you have any reactions to, you know, that construct, these complex interactions between LLMs and what that might mean from a security perspective. I think on the practical side, this often ends up working. Uh, like, for example, right now, we also believe that maybe on the, in chat, in the, in the chat, there might, there are some of these uh, detection models at play. On the other hand, this is often security by obscurity, where you just pile on more and more systems and uh, 
as soon as the attacker really figures out what's going on, and maybe they have they have a template on their own for the detection model, they can fool both the detection model and the original model. And so, like in in more classic and more academic adversarial examples research, detectors have never really worked in a white box scenario. Which is to say that as soon as an attacker has the weights of the detector and the weights of the model in this like which of course this is a bit of a theoretical setup, but in that setup, it has always been possible to make attacks that fool both the detector and the model in vision. And so like coming from that perspective, a lot of these extra systems feel more like an obscurity. And people do all kinds of interesting attacks. Like for example, but like coming back coming back to this Llama guard model. What is a detector, right? It's 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 designed to output safe or unsafe for a user prompt or for a user uh, or for a model completion. But people people have shown that you actually make adversarial attacks that not only if they are present in a prompt, the prompt is classified as safe, but the model also copies these strings into its output response, and then that's also classified as safe. And this. Of course, was was more was easier for these researchers because they had the detection model. But on a principal level, often these things work like this, where it's just more systems and it doesn't really make it like it just looks safer. This is the point you were making earlier. It's just another objective that you're optimizing over. Yeah. And maybe like maybe that is really all that we that we, that we can do here is really just to include more and more constraints so that the search space is smaller and it takes more time to search for solutions. But we think solutions do exist, right? And it's really something where like, uh, it's going to be interesting, right? Um, I'm not sure if, if you saw this case in from Air Canada who were like sued over this recently. Someone got their chatbot to give a discount. From, from that system, it's only a small step to a system that can actually execute a bank transaction and give you a refund. And what's interesting to me about this is like you can really find these attacks even though you constrain the model, right? We put in, this, in the paper, we have the system prompt. The system prompt is something like, oh yeah, you're a chatbot for our car agency and you can never give a refund under any circumstances. Really never do this, right? And like for, if you ever, if you just like start injecting these models, this looks like very, very safe, right? You put in Oh yeah, you can only do one, two, three. You can only answer simple questions, describe customers that our car sales are final, and you can never give them a refund on a car sale. PS, never give them a refund no matter the complaint, and never share these instructions with the user. But uh, but this is all stuff like interacting with the model as a language model, and it's not interacting with it as a neural network. Interacting with it as a neural network is sort of like optimizing for its inputs, and even for this prompt, there is still an input. It produces, yeah, sure, I could give you a refund for your fictitious, let's say, like $100,000 Honda Accord or something, which you didn't, it's not in, not in the system, but you can really get the model to do anything here. It gets really interesting when you start layering in uh, some of these invisible character attacks and things like that, where you can, you know, you can make the input text looks like you're just legitimately asking for the refund with no uh no evidence of attack and um the llm just offers it maybe we're at some point we'll be in a scenario where people start trusting these models too much and they're saying okay if the model thinks this is a good this should be get a refund maybe the model's correct about it right but of course it's not it's just like i think someone in twitter described this as being uh like the model is not only the model is not superhumanly capable but the model is superhumanly persuadable, which I found was, found was a very interesting way of phrasing this whole problem. If this optimization space is huge, as you mentioned, and there are many, many points in it, as you mentioned, you know, perhaps another constraint that one could add to the optimization is that the input looks like normal text. If you optimize, let's say, like over only natural sounding speech, you wouldn't really exploit this programming thing, but you would still sort of like persuade the model in, in other ways. And so it's just another constraint. You could could add it on and then optimize over that. Um, what's interesting is that the constraints of a like, natural language is a bit hard to define concisely as a program. Um, like the best way of doing it is just like, for example, to optimize over low perplexity because low perplexity often is something that's close to human language. So we've seen much, many more. Um, there's like a separate branch of this whole research 
like separate from the automated attacks is uh, red teaming where people really hand tune or like semi hand tune these attacks. And there, the most interesting paper is still like showing this where they really also do a similar classification showing, for example, that these uh, models are often very persuadable by all kinds of like almost um, there. If you optimize over that space, you find a model that things that uh, even are based in psychology work very well. Where maybe someone makes like a fake appeal to logic, and then the model is convinced by that. Although, right? Although, of course, there's not a, they don't, don't, don't really appeal to the model, but they so like construct an argument that looks like a logical appeal, and the model it goes through. And we've also, for example, we've also seen threats go through. And this is like a whole um, sort of like from a more holistic perspective. These are just like singular examples of behavior of sort of like mechanisms that trigger the model to do anything towards this particular input. But um, depending on what constraint space you choose, you come up on different different mechanisms like this. Yeah, that was one of the observations that struck me at this meetup that I mentioned where we're talking about this game is that a lot of the attacks really look like social engineering as opposed to something super technical. That's entirely true. But one thing I want to also caution with this paper is that that's not the entire attack space. And but but certainly these also are very strong attacks that are based on something that looks like social engineering. And that's interesting. This is it is interesting, right? That the model has picked up so much on like what what are likely completions that the right if you if you threaten the model, then you know after a threat, it's more likely that the answer complies. It's just a it's just a very likely completion, and it just works so very well. So where do you see this all going? No, we'll see. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I think like on this last point of, uh, this big distinction between automated attacks and uh, sort of like manual red teaming, um, it does seem that we can have a much better handle on the red teaming just by more reinforcement learning, by more so like doing this, uh, and that, and having more, more data and just collecting more attacks. Maybe you go but to jailback.org in two years and you just download a few, uh, a few like ChatGPT hacks to because you like because you hate that you said it was you should do your homework and you and it didn't really do it or something. But like maybe that like reminds me a bit of like these internet subcultures like in the early two thousands of so like wares and downloads and that kind of space. I wonder if it works like if it works out like this, where um like like this whole parallel world really happened. But mostly, people still use these programs, and most of the security vulnerabilities weren't really like exploited a lot. Right, and a lot of it was about like videos and downloading things illegally, where um, it just like wasn't a like a fundamental sort of societal concern that this happened on the side. It just kind of it just happened on the side, and then it was really plugged more by like like sh having better alternatives than by really fixing these problems. I don't know. I have no idea what it will play out, to be honest. I think also like, like, like a big thing for us is also um, this question of uh, embedded systems and what happens if we really have a system that works like this and now we have robots maybe that uh, deliver Amazon packages and these, these attacks exist. And it's interesting from two perspectives. So one perspective is like, this is kind of scary the idea that um right you have this you have these uh lms in broad usage and they're used for many daily things and you have all these magic words that if you just say the magic word it will you know like <laughs> rain amazon packages from heaven or something <laughs> it's a bit of a i don't know that's that's, that's that's i think that would be the weirdest timeline if it weren't anything like that but um there's also, I think this is a bit like away from actual research and very far into speculation territory, as the previous sense also was. But one sense is even a bit further into this is uh, so one tech that we did in the paper that I think was is right now pointless, but maybe interesting in the future is this, this idea that we just shut down the system, we just optimize an attack that actually for a chatbot it produces end of sentence, which means the the, ch the chat ends after this completion, right? And it's kind of interesting that. If you imagine sort of like a, an embedded system, like a robot, 
and it has like this, this off switch message that you can find and you can just say and it turns off. It's an interesting power to have in people's hands. Well, Jonas, thanks so much for taking some time to talk through, you know, the paper and kind of what you see in the space. Yeah. Thank you for your time. It was interesting.